for the seminar series, we first had Professor Prasad address us on astute leadership. We also had one of our alumni address us. It's time that we move on from college to industry. Uh, in spirit of continuing learning from the experts and from their experiences, we have in midst of us Mr. Vijay Gupta, Managing Director, Dairy Paper Singapore, which is world's third largest paper trading company. We welcome you, sir. <laughs> sir completed his PGP from IM Bangalore in 1981. He is an entrepreneur, advisor, and investor with 30 plus years of experience in international business in over 40 countries in areas of multi country investment projects, joint ventures, merger, and acquisitions. He regularly speaks at pulp and paper industry and trade conferences in India and has also spoken at several global forums in Asian, China and Europe. He's a founder and mentor to several companies in Singapore and India and also enjoys sharing his learnings with management students like us. He believes that we can create a better world by doing better business. We are really happy to have you here, sir. The stage is all yours. Hi friends, great pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Uh, just to get some sense, how many of you uh, have played chess? And how many of you have played cards, playing cards? I'm sure you're all familiar with the game of snakes and ladders, right? Okay. Uh, I want to introduce to you uh, business through these three simple games. We all, and especially most of us in business schools, think that Business is like a game of chess. We spend a lot of time on trying to get full information. Chess is a game where at a point in time, you have full information about you and you have full information about your opponent. And then you make your moves based on that and based on your assumptions of what, how, your opponent would react to your moves. The game of cards is a bit different. You know what you hold in your hands. You do not know what your opponents have. <coughs> Often you have to take a decision with that black box. Business and life is often like that. You can't play it as you would play a game of chess. You often have to act with less than full information or significantly less than full information. And no matter how you act, no matter what you do, where you end up could very much be like the board games of snakes and ladders. Where you end up would depend on how many snakes bit you on the way up or how many ladders you could find that you could use to really rise fast. Uh, any business, domestic business, global business, it doesn't matter. It basically starts with you the person who's conducting that business. I think uh, very simplistically to succeed you need A, B, C, D. Ability, belief, commitment and devotion. If one of these is missing, I think 
we can forget about success. Uh, you would need all of them and all of them in considerable measure. We can break down again ability. How do you define ability? As students, we all think grades we got in college define our ability. They do, but they define a very, very small part of our ability. If you look at a person holistically, if you look at a person 360 degrees, Intelligence is a very small aspect of that 360 degree view of a person. A 360 degree view, uh, the best parameters that I have learned and tried to put together in an acronym that is easy to remember is hip, hip, shaped. The first hip, absolutely essential, no matter where you start in life, is being healthy, that comes first. If you are not healthy, nobody really wants you. As an international business, I would not hire somebody who is not healthy. I wouldn't want someone going and falling sick in a foreign land and then being responsible for taking care of him and bringing him back. I would be intelligent, given. And what we have generally tried to do is think that that is the whole world. But that is one of these 12 elements of hip hip shape. And within intelligence, your grades is one small part of your intelligence. So that is how important or unimportant it is in the big context. P would be purpose driven. Uh, I think many of you have had some exposure to the corporate world and you would have experienced that many companies have become highly process driven. So much so, that process becomes even more important than purpose. You are sometimes willing to lose sight of purpose just to ensure that you are following a process. If that is how we are going to behave, I do not think we are going to be anywhere near success. The next tip happy. You have to be happy for your own good, for the good of your colleagues, for the good of vendors, for the good of customers, people working under you, people working over you. If you do not learn how to be happy, you are not going to have good people around you and without good people around you, you are not going to achieve success. Innovative. We talked about process. Now, you would need to be innovative to look at solutions outside of defined processes or defined models. The next P would be passionate. You have got to be completely involved, mind, body, soul in what you are doing. Now we come to the shaped. Sincere. Nothing replaces sincerity. Holistic. You have got to look at the big picture. You have got to look at the 360 degree view. You have got to be able to look at something through a binoculars, through your normal eyes and through a microscope. 
articulate. If you can't explain your purpose, if you can't explain what you want to do, if you can't articulate well on your goals and processes, very unlikely those would ever get followed. Perseverant. We often think perseverance is about being able to persevere until you succeed. That sort of sets a limit on your success. It's like very often you see a cricketer get to 100 and get out. Because his target was the 100, he's persevered to the 100, and then he's got out at 100. If you really want big success, if you want to score those double hundreds and triple hundreds, you've got to persevere after you've succeeded. That is what will get you to your double hundreds and triple hundreds. E is empathy. You've got to be able to put yourself in the other person's shoes. You've got to be able to think from the other side of the table. In business, you're not really buying and selling a product or service. You're building relationships. And you don't build relationships without empathy. And D, I think all of you would guess, is being decisive. Uh, I was just talking to your colleague What differentiates a successful leader today from somebody who's not so successful? There was a time when you could gain by having the best information or the best knowledge, because knowledge was not easily available to everybody. I think in today's world that has changed. Everybody has the same bit of information or knowledge. Knowledge is no longer a USP. You then had a time when your USP was your ability to analyze, the analytical tools you could use. Gone. Today, everybody has the same tools. Everybody can use them as well as you can. With the same set of knowledge and information, with the same set of analytical tools, yet different people reach different conclusions. Different people decide differently. The beauty of business, unlike a sport where you have one winner and one loser, is in business you have multiple winners. Some win big, some win small, but you can have multiple winners. The better you are at deciding, the better you are at judgment, the better would be your chances of succeeding big. Very fortunately, we are not in a zero-sum game. We are not in a game which is win-lose. We always talk about business being win-win. The, it boils down to, in business, when you work with someone, you always want to laugh, you always want to win, and you want to win big. But you cannot have a situation where you will win and the other guy would lose, because then that's not a sustainable business. So it's fine for you to laugh if other people around you are smiling, but you cannot imagine that you can laugh if people around you are weeping. That will never happen. Business we often think is very far from the world of religion or doing good or being good. You'd be surprised how close it is to the world of religion, doing good or being good. We understand the pillars of Hinduism, dharma, earth, calm. Now, dharma actually defines the outer boundaries of what you can or cannot do. 
dharma is beyond law law would define the boundaries of what you can do in a given country or in a given state or in a city dharma is a little bigger than that it also means you are responsible so your behavior is not only legally compliant it is also responsible it is also ethical so you would always want to operate within the boundaries of dharma now why do you do anything that you do there can be only two strong reasons for doing something either it's meaningful it's there's a purpose or there is pleasure so that is art and kam so anything you do either results in purpose art or results in pleasure kam now you can be within the boundaries of dharma and you can spend half your time doing things which are meaningful and half your time doing things which are purposeful uh, enjoyable you have not optimized your life you can optimize your life if you can bring these two circles together if your purpose is to be fit and you enjoy a walk in nature why would you go to the gym on a treadmill you would go and walk in nature so you achieve the purpose and you achieve the pleasure at the same time we often talked about one of the two sometimes taking a predominant role there may be a necessity for you to work you may not find the real work you enjoy fine there is a purpose you have to do it but the sooner you can find work that you also enjoy you just have to move there it doesn't mean that you don't do something that is only for purpose it doesn't mean you do not do something that is only for pleasure at times you would do something only for pleasure but the more you can put these two circles together you would optimize your life if you can bring these two together the spot where these two intersect within the boundaries of dharma that's moksha that's salvation that's heaven on earth now when we talk business and we try to operate within these parameters it does not matter whether we are doing what type of business we are doing it does not matter whether we are doing local business international business it's the same it's ultimately about dealing with people it's ultimately about building relationships it's ultimately about our following our own dharma and if you are working in a foreign land it becomes a little more complicated because you also have to follow some of their dharma it becomes a little more complicated because you also have to worry about currencies you have to worry about different laws you have to worry about different languages you have to worry about different time zones you have to worry about people having different holidays most of the west has saturday sunday as a holiday parts of the middle east and muslim world have thursday friday as a holiday part of the muslim world has friday saturday as a holiday you have time zones where if you were doing truly global business you could be working 24 hours 7 days a week so you could you would have complications of worrying about a whole lot of new parameters like uh, complying with laws in different countries if you're buying from country a operating out of country b selling to country c you have to ensure that you comply with the laws of all three countries you're buying in currency a your home currency is currency b your customers currency is currency c so you have to worry about how these three currencies and play with each other so you're adding a whole lot of complication or complex parameters to what you would do in normal domestic business why then are we so enamored about international business we have 230 countries around the world 
if you look at India today, we are in a great sweet spot. We are a large country both in terms of people and economy. If you put the smallest 60 countries of the world together, the population would add up to the population of Bangalore, just about that. It would take 160 countries, when you go from small to big, to add up the, to the population of Karnataka. It would take 197 countries to add up to the population of India. Do we still think that international business is something we should be focused on or the domestic opportunity is big? I think, again, statistics can be used different ways. It can be used to prove or disprove anything. The interesting part about international business is, despite what I've said, in numbers, the global population is six times India's population. The global economy is over 30 times India's economy. I started from small to big. If I start from big to small, excluding India, if you take the top 10 largest countries in the world, they account for 42% of the population and 50% of the GDP. So it is an exciting opportunity. You have to weigh both the opportunity here and the opportunity in, out, in the rest of the world. I live in Singapore. It's a small country, five million odd people. They have no choice. Everything, including the water, is imported. They have to rely on international trade. International trade in Singapore is three times the size of the GDP. A country like India can choose to be inward looking because of the sheer size we have. It does not mean that we should not be looking at opportunities outside. There are big opportunities outside. If it gels well into what we are doing, we should do it. But I don't think we should be overly focused on just looking at international. I don't think that's the right approach. When you're looking at business, you need to map and match make correct, correctly what you do, what are your strengths, and what does a specific market need. Should you be working in the 10 largest markets in the world? For certain products, maybe. For certain others, you would probably want to look at the 50 smallest markets in the world. That could be a niche. So how do you map and match make the product or service that you want to offer to the markets where you want to operate? A lot of us, when we look at business, first start looking at price, points, then at product, and forget about people. The most important thing in this matchmaking exercise is to find the right match of people. Because ultimately it is relationships, ultimately it is people you deal with. It's very, very important and more so in international trade that you deal with right people. Fraud is a reality. It happens in domestic trade, it happens in global trade. In global trade, the stakes are bigger. The fraud is also bigger. So if you're not careful about who you're dealing with, I think uh, we spend a lot of time trying to reduce the list. If I have 100 potential clients, I'm trying to see which clients not to work with. Narrow it down to, uh, I know out of 100, I can finally work with 10. So can I start with mapping these 100 clients well and arriving at 20 that are worth working with? If I spend time effort on those 20, my hit rate is one in two. Otherwise, I would be going around 100. I would still be able to finally do business with 10. So my hit rate would be one in 10. And I might hit the wrong one. That's a snake.
Also, when you are looking at international business, in domestic business, you are starting from ground zero. In international business, if you are a newcomer, you're starting from minus something. Someone is looking at you as a new face, different culture, different language, doesn't know whether to trust you, not to trust you. Doesn't know whether you'll fulfill, not fulfill your commitments. So there are a whole lot of additional challenges. So you've got to be prepared for that extra effort. Realizing that yes, you're not starting from zero, you're starting from minus two, minus three, wherever it is. The way international business has grown is also very interesting. If you look at the world post World War II, a lot of globalization was about wage arbitration. You had companies that started producing in Japan after World War II. Japan after the war was ravaged, costs were low. They could produce good quality products. They were doing it before the war. So they had that reliability factor. And they were cheaper than the West. So you saw the first wave of industrialization producing for the world market happen in Japan in the 50s and 60s. Over time, Japan started getting expensive. Some of the low value add manufacturing moved to Korea. It then moved to Taiwan, then moved to Southeast Asia. And then somewhere in the 80s, it moved to China. It has been in China. I think it will continue to be there for a while. But in China, it has moved from the eastern coast to inland China. So it was all about wage arbitration. If you look at the big Indian story, IT services export, it was, again, wage arbitration. The world was perplexed about what would happen with Y2K. India was the only country with enough English speaking and computer literate people who could help them to rework all the old data into Y2K compliant data. And it was a low cost place. After that, we have gone up the value chain. I wouldn't say we have done sufficiently well on that, but we have moved up the value chain. But it started with that. We are facing a very, very different world today. Wage arbitration is no longer going to work. If you look at the key trends in the world today, I have identified five that we see all around. Robotics. I don't know if you've read about China becoming the largest user of robotics today. Wage costs in China went up 200% over the last five years. Population in China has been flattish or coming down. And China is looking to use robotics in a big way for manufacturing. You have a lot of manufacturing going back to the US driven by robotics. Because a factory that needed 1,000 people in the past needs 50 people and some robots. So robotics is going to take away this element of manufacturing wage arbitration. And in the future, I think manufacturing, if it's going to be done with robotics, is going to be done closer to markets, not closer to cheap labor. That again puts India in a sweet spot because we have a huge market. It's a growing market. It's expected to be the fastest growing market of the next 30 years. So while I think you should all look at international trade and international opportunities, do not look at it and get blindsided on what opportunities exist here in India. The next is Internet of Things. You know how that is driving uh, the world. Self-driving cars is going to be one of the big outcomes of Internet of Things. It is going to 
completely changed the way we think about transportation, drivers, Uber, and everything else. 3D printing or additive manufacturing. Uh, we have a lot of uh, unique equipment, equipment that is not mass produced. People carry spares for that equipment for 100 years or 50 years and it's never used and then it's just discarded. You don't need to do that anymore. You can produce the spares on demand using 3D printing. A ship carries a lot of spares out to sea. Uh, all they need to carry is a 3D printer with some material where they can produce those spares as required. So I think 3D printing is going to change dramatically the way we see the world. Renewable energy. Uh, I think you've all been watching this space where power prices from solar have dropped to below power prices from thermal today. Uh, you're going to see some huge impact of the cost economics there. The biggest disadvantage that solar had about only being able to produce eight or 10 hours in a day and then storage People are finding very innovative solutions for storage. Uh, apart from what Elon Musk is doing about uh, low cost batteries and high storage, uh, one very innovative solution that has already been used somewhere is you generate power in the day. Part of it is used. Part of it is used to pump water up. And you have a large storage tank up. Water comes down by gravity in the night and you run turbines to generate power in the night. So it's a very, very low cost way of preserving solar energy for use when the sun is not out. So you will find a lot of such innovations which will uh, change the way we think of uh, energy. And artificial intelligence. We talked about what robotics is doing to manufacturing. Artificial intelligence has the ability to do that to office jobs. Uh, you might have read about uh, some of the investment companies where they found that AI could do much better than their hotshot investment managers in identifying investment opportunities. A lot of the very routine work AI has been able to do in an hour what lawyers take 30,000 hours to do. So you can see how many lawyers that could replace. So these are large trends that are going to change the world. The other big trend we see is the growth of mega cities and this mega cities becoming more important than countries. Uh, today we talk about 230 countries. Uh, there will be a time in the very near future, I think we've already started talking about it at certain forums, where we are going to focus on 300 cities in the world. 300 cities in the world are going to account for more than 60% of the world's GDP. 10 to 15 cities of, of those 300 will be in India. And each city like I said, you would add 60 small countries to make up Bangalore. Now, each of these cities would be as big and as important as the 100 small countries in the world. So when you look at internationalization or globalization today, I think you would have to take a more city-centric than a country-centric approach. So if your objective is to look at being in international business. Uh, it would be good look at which of those 300 cities make sense to you. A good place to start, I don't know how many of you have seen a website called City Mayors. They list out the largest cities in the world by income, by population, by various metrics. Uh, you would find 300 of the largest cities by various parameters listed there. That would be a good place to start. Uh, again, to re-emphasize, uh, a lot of opportunity in the world, but also a lot of opportunity here in India. 
look at both very very objectively uh, you can't look to being a leader in the world if you're not a leader at home so if you want to be in some space where you want to be a world leader it has to start with your being a leader at home open to any questions comments I think uh, our, uh, I will go back to what I spoke about dharm, earth, kam. Right? Our objective, the purpose is pleasure and let us say the other purpose of jobs was some money, some income to sustain a lifestyle. Now, if you are doing work because you enjoyed work, maybe that is going to be the future of work. You are not going to be working for pay, you are going to be working because you enjoy working. Uh, otherwise, you will have means of getting an income, you will have means of getting pleasure. Today you play a game, you play a sport, it is for fun, so work should be that way. I think it is at least 50 years away, but that is where we are heading. So, I do not think uh, it is a great idea to have people working 80 hour days. I do not think it is a great idea to put, you know, we have a very, very odd concept of work life balance. I do not know where this came from. I thought you would put life first. Uh, also, we have a very unique misunderstanding of this concept. We think that work life balance is like a seesaw. So, if work goes down, life goes up. If life goes down, work goes up. It does not work that way. It is like a swing. I think both work in tandem. Uh, you cannot, I cannot imagine somebody would say, my work is lousy, life is great, or life is lousy, work is great. I do not think it works that way. So, I think first we need to put life before work and two we need to realize it is life and work until uh, you know the time that artificial intelligence takes over our work we will move in tandem and then we will think work is like play, work is like hobby. We will still have our needs taken care of because we will create enough efficiency in the system. I mean you had a time when 80 percent of the world toiled in fields. 12 hour days to give us food. Today, 4 percent of the world's people spending couple of hours in the field every day can give us our food. So, you will have a time when we will be much more efficient at meeting our needs. Challenge we have had is we met those needs and then we have added more. So, we can keep adding to those needs or wants and that can complicate things a bit. But uh, I would not worry too much about uh, AI taking away jobs. You see, I think we have to look at all these technologies as something as enablers uh, used with human intelligence, they would make life better. Would they mean, would it mean more work? I do not know how many of you think more work is good. Wouldn't you all be happy if you had less work but the same pay or more pay? <laughs> so, I think we have sort of we are equating more work with more pay which will go away, which should go away. It does not work that way. I do not think uh, Bill Gates or Warren Buffet works that much longer than some of us do. So, I do not think it is about work hours related to pay in that sense. 
but it's still 50 years away so don't worry uh, sir hi uh, this is regarding a question uh, uh, regarding the protectionism kind of uh, wave that is happening around the world, especially in the US and some of the big economies. Um, so two questions related to that. One, uh, do you see it as some sort of a sustainable trend? Two, uh, what would someone like us, uh, you know, with uh, new families and so on should do to sort of minimize the risks that uh, arise from such uh, Moments. Yeah, I would like to go back a little in history. We had a fairly simple world. The world was about my country and the rest of the world. That's how the world worked. So, as a sovereign nation, I had every right to give protection, give subsidy, do what I like with my country and treat the rest of the world as different from my country. Then we came up with concepts of regional blocks. So you had NAFTA, you had SARC, you had ASEAN, you had Far East economic regions. So you started creating, you had A and B, now you had A and B1 and B2. Then you started creating trade agreements with countries called most favored nation. So you created a B1, B2, B3. Then you said you will have anti-dumping, countervailing duties on some countries. So you said B1, B2, B3, B4. So you just complicated this B into too many uh, things. If you look at what uh, the US is trying to do, they're trying to take out some of these artificial barriers which over time was created and say, yes, we will have US and we'll have the rest of the world. And if NAFTA enjoyed certain preferences or Mexico enjoyed certain preferences, they will not in future. Logically, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it doesn't make sense to have so many complications. And today, to define a product as made in a particular country is also very, very difficult. Because the same product has components coming from all over the world. So how do you define this product? Where was this product made? So if we get back to a simple world and say, yes, my country enjoys subsidies, enjoys protectionism, enjoys whatever, every country has a right to do that, and the rest of the world, which I will treat a little differently from how I'll treat my country. It is sustainable. In the short term, there will be pain because the world got used to that complex system. The world got used to taking advantage of those complex systems. So you had American companies going and producing in Mexico for the American market or Japanese companies producing in China for the Japanese market. So it will take time to realign. But in my view, it would be great if we get back to a simplistic model. Uh, ultimately, the global market, as far as products are concerned, will move to manufacturing where the large markets are. So it's not going to be about manufacturing in, say, a very small country, which has no home market for that, and just for the global market. So you will produce in India for the world market, because India itself is a big market. So then you could produce a little more here, which would go to some of the smaller countries. So you would look at the five, ten big markets in the world, and produce in those five or ten markets. And those five or ten markets would cater to the whole world. But it doesn't make sense if you're going to produce, say, in a place like Singapore, we have some products being produced there uh, for the world market. So Singapore itself is infinitely small. It's, a, it's uh, 5 million people in a 7.3 billion world. So why would you want to produce something in a country where there's no market for it? So I think that will change quite dramatically. Uh, pain points in the short term, but I think good for the medium long term. And I think behind all this, we'll all have to get used to the idea of producing where the big markets are. So production will go back to the US because it's the biggest market. China is already a very big producer. India will see a lot of manufacturing happen here. So if you take the 10 big markets, those will be the 10 manufacturing, big manufacturing points as well. Why should Mexico, which is neither a market nor great technology, be a production base for the world?
Hello, sir. I'm Jimmy. Uh, thank you for the great insights. Uh, I just have a question related to, uh, you mentioned a lot of points uh, regarding disruptions that are happening in the industry and in the world today, uh, where you mentioned about uh, artificial intelligence and autonomous cars and also the power center moving from the west to the east now and uh, also tier two and tier three cities now becoming and growing as economic hubs. Uh, I want to ask you what are your perceptions about what can India do as a country and also uh, we as business leaders so that we could, we are perceived as a service based economy today and also as a low cost center. And uh, what can we do to change the perception of the world towards us and also become power centers or we can, I, I could say drivers in these uh, changing disruptions in the world? For, for any product or service that you are uh, offering, there are three key things that would make it a success. Mm. One is, I mean, we call it CBF, cheaper, better, faster, right? Now, I think we have to be very careful. Cheaper is very different from cheap. Cheaper does not mean cheap. So when we say cheaper, we are meaning the same quality, the same product at a cheaper price. We are not meaning a cheap product. Better, as to whatever you have, you have either a better product or a replacement which is better. And faster, we have a world that wants things now. Right? In anything we do, whether it is domestic market or global market, if you have two of these three elements in your product or service, you have a fair chance of succeeding. If you have three of these three, you have a very good chance of succeeding. If you have less than two, go and redesign. It's not going to work. I mean, you, uh, if you see what uh, Microsoft did to Lotus, or if you see what Google did to AOL or other, Yahoo or other search engines. Uh, now, if you look at the Google, Google was free, Yahoo was free, AOL was free. Right? So in a way, you couldn't go cheaper. Better, faster. So they meant that. Now, indirectly cheaper, because you took less time, less time on your internet or less time on your Wi-Fi. So they had all three, and we see the success they had. If you look at uh, any product that's or service that's a hit, it probably has all three. Any product that has two has some chance of surviving until somebody comes along with all three. So you're always in a high risk space. But if you have less than two, I think don't even venture. Uh, it is a competitive environment. It is a brutal environment. And nobody has the time for something that's not a winner. Everybody is only looking for winners. Uh, it would be immaterial, whether you're looking at domestic market or global market. Uh, what I was highlighting earlier about the immense opportunity we have in India is the fact that India is a big home market. India is a market that is going to be the fastest growing over the next 30 years. Uh, there's a EIU study which talks about India growing 30x in the next 35 years. In the same 35 years, uh, that's a study about where countries would be in 2050. Uh, US would grow 4x, China would grow 10x, and India would grow 30x in that space. So I think uh, we are in a great, uh, we are in a place with great opportunity. Let's look at global opportunities, but let's also not lose sight of this in chasing some of the global opportunities. But home or overseas, if you're not cheaper, better, faster, try to redesign what you're doing.
how do you how do you make decisions with those unpleasant See, I think the the key about being decisive is again we are not saying uh, you play blind. I'll go back to the example of cards. Right? You are making decisions without full information but you are making decisions based on some information and some experience and some knowledge. You know that if you hold three aces, somebody else does not, if you are dealing one pack. Right? So, you are making decisions based on part information, part conjecture. You will not always be right, it is just not possible. Uh, there was an interesting study about seven, eight years back on what makes successful businessmen successful. And the initial hypothesis was that they make more right decisions. Uh, the study found that if you look at the percentage of decisions made by these successful people, right or wrong, they had made less right decisions. But they were successful because they took far more decisions. So, there was somebody who spent enormous time taking one decision in a month and it was right. And there was somebody who took 10 decisions in a month, 8 were right. The guy who took 10 was the most successful guy. So, you will have to be prepared for the, you see, regardless of how much information you have, even in a game of chess, you know the present, you do not know the future. You can have some expectations of what your opponent will, be, will do, you do not definitely know what he will do. So, we have to accept the fact that the future is unpredictable. Uh, we can come up with all kinds of theories and expectations of the future, but it is unpredictable. And therefore, when you are taking decisions today and putting a lot of uh, money, people, lives, livelihoods at stake. Uh, you have to bear that in mind that some will go wrong and you will take only those decisions where going wrong means it will hurt you, it will not kill you. Each one can have a different threshold for that, but you have got to be cautious that you do not take decisions that one decision can kill you. I think Jimmy mentioned uh, this regarding, uh, you know, the West looking towards the East, you know, uh, and uh, I could uh, relate to some instances where uh, the companies in Asia were looking towards the West in terms of improving their, uh, you know, uh, skill sets or company performances. For example, I think India is trying to, uh, or our Prime Minister Mr. Modi is trying to, uh, you know, localize the manufacturing sectors in India and trying to, you know, introduce make in India concepts in the similar way that, you know, Trump is trying to, you know, introduce policies like make in USA, buy in USA and do it in there. And Australia it's, recently it's, also it's did the same Trump thing. copying Modi, not the other way around. Modi started it first. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's like the grass is always greener on the other side. The West is looking towards the East and the East is looking towards the West. So, do not you think that India should uh, try to, uh, you know, set its own position or try to bring its own identity? See, let me, I, I agree with your view that everybody tends to look at the grass on the other side being greener. Uh, I will share a secret, uh, you know, I have been in business 35 years. For 35 years, every single day, we have felt the future is bright, today is challenging. That has not changed and that will not change. Okay. So, you will have challenges. I think opportunities and challenges will go together. If you had an opportunity without a challenge, there would be too many people jumping on that opportunity and it would no longer be an opportunity. An opportunity is an opportunity because it comes bundled with challenges. So, only the 
better equipped people are able to avail it. Uh, about West and East, I think, uh, again, you look at the other side, you find some good things. You haven't seen it fully, right? So, a half, when you know half the picture, like if somebody comes to your home and only looks at the living room, it probably is the best part of your home. You don't know the rest of the home. So, what you are looking on the other side is you are looking at what they want, what is for sure, what is the living room. You are not seeing the difficulties, the challenges they are facing. They are seeing the good on this side, they are not seeing the difficulties on this side. But Eastern knowledge and ancient Indian knowledge, now a lot of people are waking up to the strength of that. To share a perspective, we all talk about corporate structures, we all talk about country structures. Uh, and I have looked at many companies and countries. I have not come across any structure which could be better designed than the concept of Hindu gods. Okay. You have a creator, operator, destroyer. So, you have a CEO, you have a, you know, you have all the functional heads, you have all the regional heads, you have all the local heads, <laughs> you even have family heads. Plus, this is omnipresent. What better structure of governance can you create for any country or company? You know, we've, I've always felt if I want to design a structure for a company, I should look at the structure of gods and try to replicate parts of it. Of course, you don't need such an elaborate structure, but parts of it. And it works beautifully. Uh, I don't know who came up with this concept, but if you look at it deeply, it's a great concept. And I don't know how many of you know, Vishnu is the CEO, Lakshmi is the CFO, right? Now. Lakshmi is the wife of Vishnu, the two most powerful people in the day to day operating of the world and they had no kids because they wanted to have treat everybody equal. So, there is there's a lot of thought that has gone into the structure. We have only looked to the west, we have not looked at some of these very interesting things. See, I was uh, told when I was young that you, know, you go to a temple for the morning arti, that will make you healthy, wealthy and wise. A lot of us have heard that, a lot of us maybe have practiced that. And I was trying to understand this. The concept behind it is temples were always built on the highest point in a town or village, because you wanted to put God on a pedestal. So, it was on a hill or a hillock or whatever was there. Right? So, if you went up the temple, fresh air, you climbed up, that made you healthy. The morning arti was usually 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. You took your bath, went for the arti, so you had a long day to work, that made you wealthy. And those were days before the internet and all our other media. So, you met people there, you exchanged notes, you exchanged views, that made you wise. It was not some stone idol that you went and prayed and that made you healthy, wealthy and wise. So, today if you are going to go at 10 o'clock in your car for a morning arti, because now the arti has got extended from 5.30 it goes to 11 o'clock. And you do not need uh, so, you do not have that wealthy, you do not have healthy and you do not need that, there is nobody there to exchange information, everybody comes just, uh, it is a deal they are doing, coming, praying and walking out. So, I do not think that will make you healthy, wealthy and wise anymore. But when it was thought of, when it was propagated, there is a strong reason behind it. We learnt it as a practice, we did not see what was behind it. If we try to go behind it, I mean if you look at uh, many of our scriptures, 
with an immense body of wisdom and knowledge. And I think fortunately, we have started waking up to it. Fortunately, in recent times, there's a lot of both domestic and international attention on this, on how some of this ancient wisdom can be used to better our lives. So, so you have been a leader for many, many years. If you were to give an advice to someone who's just getting into the role of leadership, what would that be, especially in the ethics and character zone? The, uh, I mean, I started with saying the boundaries of dharma. I think those are non-negotiable. It's not just about complying with the law. It is also about, see, I'll give you some uh, examples of conflicts here, right? Your personal dharma does not tell you that you have to pay your taxes. It's not your personal dharma anyway. The law of the land requires you to pay taxes. You will have to do, you know, whatever, uh, you take your personal dharma, you take your law of the land, you take ethics, you take responsibility, you will have to do the best of all of that. You will have to combine the best of all of that and do that. You can't say I'm legally compliant and then you know you're doing a lot of unethical things. Or I say I'm ethical but I'm doing irresponsible things, maybe in terms of environment, maybe in terms of my other stakeholders. So when I say ethical and responsible, it's towards all my stakeholders, my employees, my colleagues, my vendors, my customers, my financiers, my shareholders. So I think it's absolutely critical that those, that boundary of dharma is. So are these boundaries personal or they are uh, company compliance? They are personal. You see, a company would draw its own boundaries, but I would expect each one of us to set a standard which is a combination of what the company has done and what we believe in. So I would think that we should set our standards higher than what the company has done. I would Ever in a conflict? There will be conflicts. There will be, uh, see what we call again, if you go back to our ancient, we call dharma sankat. Right? So there can be one dharma, my dharma as an employee to make maximum profits for my company, my dharma as a human being to also ensure that I am fair to whoever I am dealing with. So would I compromise on that fairness to meet my company dharma or would I set this higher standard and say I am going to do both? So when there are conflicts, the higher one should prevail. And just off the topic, but uh, can you tell us, uh, can you speak something about the paper industry, the industry you work in, about future, how it is going, uh, what do you expect, what changes do you expect with AI coming in and different things changing around the world? Uh, two minutes on just your industry you work in. I could take two days. <laughs> I must thank you because I, that this is an opportunity I'd never lose out on. See, one first, let me dispel some common myths. One, people believe the paper industry cuts trees, harms the environment. That's a perfect myth. For the paper industry, trees are raw material. Okay? It's like food. You, an agriculturist, he sows, he harvests. So if you tell the agriculturist not to harvest, then we'll all go hungry. Right? So as an industry, trees are raw material. The industry, because not because they want to make a good world for your children or your grandchildren, but because they need raw material to run their plants, 
after 2 years or 3 years or 5 years, they have to plant far more trees than they cut. So, as an industry we plant 1 and a half to 2 times the trees we cut. Otherwise, it is not sustainable. You are not investing billions of dollars in plant machinery to make paper and not have raw material. right? So, this is one. Two, another myth is paperless office, paperless world, paper industry will die. Office paper accounts for less than 4 percent of the world's paper consumption. 65 percent of the world's paper is used in packaging, packaging and that is growing. 7 percent of the world's paper is used in the hygiene space. Uh, again, I talked about hip hip shaped as individuals. In the paper industry, we have another hip. Hygiene, information, packaging. Okay. Hygiene space is 7 percent of the industry growing quite rapidly. Uh, no, to my knowledge, until I got into this hall, I had not come across an app that replaces tissue. It is still growing at a healthy 4 5 percent annually. Information papers, which is papers we read and write on, that is under pressure because information papers, which used to be, uh, I mean, paper industry had a monopoly on the way information was created, transmitted, shared, stored, everything was on paper. So, until the late 80s, we had a monopoly on information. Now, we share that space with digital. It is no longer a monopoly. We are still the biggest. We are still bigger than digital, but we have lost the monopoly status. So, information papers on a global basis is coming down. In countries like India, it is still growing because our base was very small. But on a global basis, on a global basis, this is coming down. It will continue to come down. Again, you will have to find the more efficient combination. I do not think we should look at it as paper versus digital. It is paper and digital. So, I will create a information electronically. I will transmit it electronically. Somebody receiving it, if he is more comfortable reading on paper, he will print it. Right? Anyway, it is more reliable. Uh, I mean, batteries do not die out, software does not become obsolete, it's, uh, you do not have to switch it off, take off a landing on a plane. So, this is much more reliable, but it is declining. We are losing our monopoly status and we think the industry globally will continue to decline. Newspapers in the western world is dying, magazines is dying, trade directories is dead. So, information papers are probably declining at about 2 percent annually. Packaging is 65 percent of our industry and it is growing and it is growing very fast. And with more e-commerce, you will see a lot more packaging because something that you just went and bought in one shopping bag is now going to come in a carton and outer carton and another carton. So, as an industry, I think we have a great future. We will grow more trees than we need. We will have a bigger market than we have today. But one segment of our industry, which is the information sector, we have lost our monopoly status. We are still the biggest. If you had something very, very important, you would not rely on digital. You would still want to print out. So, I think uh, it is one of the oldest industries, been around for 1500 years and I think it will last, uh, because it is based on a renewable raw material, it is never going to die. It is not like oil or, or aluminum or copper, you will say one day the world is run out of aluminum. So, there is no more aluminum industry, but we grow trees, we cut trees, we make paper, we grow more trees, we cut more trees, we make paper. So, we will continue. Do you need managers, sir? Because we have supply. Sorry? <laughs> Me? I was just joking. Do you need managers for your company? Because we have huge supply. Of course. Uh, 
we we don't need uh, we don't need managers and i think this is something you should all uh, ingrain in your mind okay when you say manager you're managing something that exists you are trying to be the vishnu we need brahmas we need people to create businesses Managing a business is a very low benchmark you're setting yourself, if that's the benchmark you're setting yourself. You should think of how you can create businesses, how you can build businesses. I've had, see, I had, when I graduated, I had no grand plans. I, I was clear I wanted to be in business. I was clear I wanted to be my own boss. Uh, I started trading in electronic products. Uh, this was in 81. I moved to paper in 85. Uh, initial model of business. When you talk of international business, again, it can be very different models. You could be looking at the import model, you could be looking at an export model, you could be looking at third country trading. So we started in 85 with an import model. We were operating from India and importing papers and raw material for the paper industry into India. 1987, the government of India suddenly brought in a 25% tax on raw material that we were importing for the industry. We suddenly had customers wanting us to cancel orders. So we had committed to suppliers. And we said, we can't walk out of those commitments. So we, I went out to Indonesia, Thailand, which were some of the other neighboring large paper industry markets and tried to sell what we had to those people. We took some losses. We said, let's complete the transaction. Let's close those contracts. That happened. That was done. Fortunately, our customers liked what we shipped to them. So next month, they came back to us. Can you give us a new offer? And we said, sure, we can. It's not the same price, because that was a distressed price. But we can offer you the product. So that led us from an import model to doing third country trading, where we were buying from different countries and then trying to sell in Southeast Asia. And India in those days was not conducive to this kind of trade. Even today it is not, but in those days it was completely not possible. So that forced me to move out of India. Singapore was the ideal location because Southeast Asia, but it wasn't easy to get a business visa to go to Singapore. So I landed up in Hong Kong in 88, traded out of Hong Kong for a year, then applied for a Singapore visa from Hong Kong, got into Singapore in 89. And we were doing this trade. Uh, Dai Papers, it's part of a Japanese group called Kokusai Pulp and Paper. It's an old company formed in 1924. We were their largest customers for the Indian market because we had already established a base here. We were their largest customers for this market. So when India started opening up, uh, they saw the growth in our business and they said, why don't we further enhance on this together? So that's how we set up a joint venture company in Singapore, which was between Kokosai Pulp and Paper and our family. So this company started in year 2000. Uh, as I was sharing with you, we see now the opportunities in India are much bigger. We moved to Singapore because of circumstance opportunity there. So in the last five years, we've had very, very significant growth in India. And uh, I am, in fact, in the process of considering a move back to India because we think the next 20 years, India is the best place to be from a business perspective. I 
I think we, uh, we as Indians have a great advantage. Uh, we had a lot of diversity in the way business was done even within India. Of course, now with GST coming, probably some of it will get reduced. But you had different laws, different tax structures, different languages, different cultures within India. So if you were working in India, you already had enough exposure to working in a multi-dimensional environment. Uh, somebody from Delhi who comes to Bangalore would probably initially feel as uncomfortable as somebody from Bangalore who went to Singapore. But that's about it, because we are already very used to a multilateral existence. So if somebody had come from a very, very homogeneous environment, it would be much more difficult for him. So the exposure in India was a great help in adapting well to a different environment. The basics are the same. Uh, the basics of business One thing I learned early in my business uh, career was, you know, we used to hear this, I think many of you have heard this, customer is king. And I had heard it many times. And a lot of our customers were behaving like kings. So I had a problem shipment in Thailand. And I had gone there to resolve the problem. And during the conversation, this came up that, uh, you know, I was a little uh, adamant about something, and he said, "How can you talk like that? You know, customer is king." I said, "Sorry, sir. Customer is not king. Customer is God." Let me explain the difference. A king can be unfair. A king can be arrogant. God cannot be unfair. God cannot be arrogant. So I said, you are God, I leave the decision to you, but please take a decision as God, be fair, and close it. He came up with a solution which was very, very easily acceptable to me. Okay. You, you can't allow, while saying customer is king, you can't allow him to take undue advantage of you. If you make him God, he'll never take undue advantage. Thank you, Mr. Vijay, for taking out time to speaking to us. Uh, I came to know you were in India for a short business trip. So we appreciate you took time out of your busy schedule. And your views on futures of businesses were very insightful. Uh, I am Bangalore. EPGP team has a small token of appreciation for you. Uh, can I ask Subrashmita to present the token of appreciation to Mr. Vijay? Thank you. It's been a pleasure.